Well, at this time of the year in the garden, sometimes we kind of have a hard time keeping up with things, and particularly when it comes to picking cucumbers. These things really can come on fast, and if we don't keep our cucumbers picked about every day or, or couple of days or so, you know they can get ahead of you pretty fast. These particular cucumbers are doing real well. This variety is Sprint. It's a slicing variety as opposed to a pickling variety but yet it is a cucumber that has an excellent flavor to it and the shape and the color of them are so uh, good that it's one that you probably want to include in your garden as far as a, um, a slicing cucumber goes. One of the things about cucumbers and also uh, squash, which is related to cucumber of course, is that you want to continue harvest because if you don't continue your harvest throughout the season and you allow these things to get too large on the plant, uh, it sort of signals this plant to slow down in its producing of, of flowers. And you may find that your production will drastically decrease or decline if you don't continue picking. For example, this one is getting a little bit large here. We may have a tendency to uh, allow many of them to get large like this if we've got so many cucumbers we can't use them. But my suggestion would be to continue to harvest the cucumbers and the squash. If you can't use them all, then give them to a neighbor or to a friend or put them in your compost pile or just pick them off and get rid of them so that this plant will continue to produce flowers and you will have cucumbers or squash for a long period of time. There's a few problems that are showing up in cucumbers now. I know many people are concerned about their cucumbers getting bitter and one of the things that causes bitterness in cucumbers is something that puts that plant into stress. Maybe a, a, a difference in, in the way that you're caring for it. Perhaps it's ran out of nutrients, uh, out of fertilizer. Uh, perhaps uh, it's uh, suffering from some very dry conditions or maybe even a heavy infestation of some insect. But if this plant goes into stress, you may see some of these uh, flavors that cause bitterness build up in the cucumber. Usually the bitterness is just in the outer edge of the cucumber, and so if you peel it off, you may get rid of most of that bitterness. And it's also normally more concentrated in the stem end. So if you have a lot of cucumbers and you've got some bitterness, you can probably trim most of that away. One of the things that you may want to do, of course, is keep your cucumbers healthy. Keep them well, well watered. Uh, keep them occasionally give them a slight application of nitrogen to keep the plants green and actively growing. And then, of course, also keep them harvested. We, on these cucumbers here, you notice that we've got them growing on a trellis. Now, that's a, a pretty good idea for people to consider if they have a small growing area and they don't think they've got enough room to let a vining type crop run on the ground. You can use a trellis such as we have here or other types of trellis, even a tomato cage works quite well to plant cucumbers on them grow up. But by just taking advantage of your vertical space here, uh, you can see uh, that we're growing quite a few cucumbers in just a very small area here. I also want to point out something else that we're seeing on our cucumbers here. Uh, we have, within the last few days, developed a disease that is some type of a wilt. It could be bacterial wilt. I'm not sure exactly which one it is, but this is very, very common in many of our cucurbit crops, such as cucumbers and watermelons and squash and those related crops, and that you'll probably see just one limb or one portion of the plant begin to wilt, and then very quickly that entire limb will be gone. Now, this is a, a disease that can spread very quickly through your plant. Many of the wilt diseases, uh, and particularly bacterial wilt, is caused by uh, a, a bacterial that is spread through insects, particularly the cucumber beetle. So one of the things you want to be sure and do is try to keep your, your plants as free of cucumber beetles and other insects as possible with the application of seven or malathion or thiodin or pesticides such as that that will control the cucumber and be able to keep the, the wilt from spreading from plant to plant. But we also want to be cautious in using these materials because these are also very dangerous and toxic to the honeybee, which is the main source of pollination for the cucumber and for the squash. So what you would want to do is probably let the honeybees do their uh, pollinating early in the morning or by midday and then come in late in the afternoon or evening and apply your pesticide for the cucumber beetle or why the insect you're trying to control because in fact that's when that population shows up most also. And what we will probably do is come in and remove all of these wilted limbs here uh, with uh, a pruning shear being careful not to, to uh, use that uh, instrument then on a healthy plant unless we've disinfected it. Get rid of all of those, 
uh, put them in the trash or burn them, not in the compost pile. Try to clean these up a little bit and hopefully we will control this wilt somewhat because it is a very, uh, very dangerous, uh, or I shouldn't say dangerous, but a very damaging disease uh, to the cucumbers. But I think this is a very nice little cucumber patch. Uh, we might want to mention here also though that if you're looking for some varieties that are resistant to wilt, to cucumber beetles, and also to bitterness, then you may want to consider, uh, consider the county fair variety. County fair is not like this one in that it's not really a slicing cucumber. It's more of an all-purpose cucumber. It looks more like the pickling types, but it does make a good all-purpose cucumber both for pickling and for slicing, but it does have these good qualities of being very prolific and also resistant to cucumber beetle and resistant to wilt and to bitterness, as I mentioned. But cucumbers are a, a very healthy uh, crop to enjoy in our garden, and you can grow a pretty good patch of cucumbers in a vertical space like this. And speaking of vertical spaces, uh, there are also other plants you can grow this manner. For instance, we have some pole beans. Let's go down and look, take a look at those because they're really beginning to produce now. We have to do a little bit of harvesting on our pole beans. From looking at our pole beans here, we're going to have a pretty good crop of beans in the garden too. That's one of the things I like about growing this pole bean. This is Kentucky Wonder, a really old variety, but one that's, that still has maintained uh, its good qualities throughout the years. And as I mentioned, you can grow a lot of beans like you can your cucumbers in a relatively small area. We have about a, oh, probably a three and a half by four and a half foot space here. And we're probably gonna have more beans than an average size family would want. Because you see this particular variety of, of pole bean, the Kentucky Wonder, really is a pretty heavy producer. We're just now beginning to harvest it, but there's so many little beans on there and still it's flowering that uh, we're probably gonna have beans for the next several weeks. And the thing I like about this bean also is that even as it begins to get uh, large or as, as the pods get some size on them, they still remain tender and rather free of strings. I've picked uh, a few in my hand here, all different sizes really, but these uh, two here are really pretty good size, but you can see I can still snap those things really pretty easily and very, very little strings on them. This I also think brings up a point about bean varieties. If you're going to be growing beans in your garden, not only for fresh use, but also for canning or for some other form of processing, you may want to consider using a flat potted variety like the Kentucky Wonder because it seems to hold its flavor and its texture much better after canning than do some of the round potted varieties. So I'm going to encourage you, if you've not tried pole beans in your garden and you'd like to, then you may want to grow some pole beans next year or you may even want to plant some for this fall. Uh, pole beans take a little bit longer than bush beans and uh, you really may not do as well by planting now for fall pole beans, but certainly some of the bush Kentucky Wonders or other varieties of bush beans would do very well in your garden if you plant those in the fall garden. And we are going to be talking a little bit about fall gardening within the next few weeks here on Oklahoma Gardening. Then we can move on down the garden here and take a look at our okra. It's also doing very well, much like the cucumbers though. The okra is a plant that you pretty well have to pick every day or the size of the, of the fruit is going to get ahead of you. And we're just beginning to pick a little bit of okra here on our plants. This variety is Lee. It's a dwarf variety. And so again, it doesn't take up too much space in the garden like some of the older tall varieties do. And with just a few stalks of Lee or other okra for that matter, you can really have a bountiful supply of okra because they are, it is very heavy producers. Let's take a look at some of this okra. Here I mentioned that it, it can get too large on you if you don't harvest it on a regular basis. Here's one that's really getting a little bit large. Uh, this okra, because of, of the, the size of the pod, not only is going to be very long and big around, but it's also going to be tough. I like to pick the okra when it's somewhere between about two and a half inches to five inches in length. And you can either snap it off with your hands, use some pruning shears, or of course uh, a pocket knife or some other instrument to cut it clean from the stalk. Like the cucumbers, also you want to continue harvesting so that okra continues producing throughout the season. We may cut into some of this okra. This one here that is pretty large, of course, is going to be more seedy inside. And although it did seem to cut rather easily, when you begin to fry this okra or boil the okra, however you want to use it, you're going to find that it has much more fiber in here and it's much more woody and won't be nearly as tasty as the smaller okra that's very tender and the seeds are relatively immature and small as compared to the large okra. So uh, 
One little tip is be sure again to keep your okra well cared for as far as plenty of water, plenty of fertilizer, and harvest it on schedule so you don't run into some of the problems with getting the okra too large and uh, also with uh, the uh, produce production going down. We have another variety of okra here that's kind of interesting. This is a red variety. It's a variety from the University of Georgia that we've tried in the garden just to see what it's like. This is a different, not only a different growth habit on the plant, but a different uh, growth habit of the pod itself. You see these pods are much more longer and slender, or more slender than the standard varieties such as the Lee. But still they make a very delightful uh, okra for the garden and a little bit different because of the color. This particular variety does not uh, have as thick a seed pod as the Lee does. And so again, it's a very tender okra and probably you could even let it get a little bit larger than you could Lee or some of the other varieties and still have a very uh, tender okra here. Well, there's lots of things going on in the garden now. A lot of harvesting that is being done. Uh, probably one of the favorites of, of all gardeners, of course, is sweet corn. And we have had a little bit of sweet corn in the garden, but uh, we've also had a problem or two with the sweet corn. And I think we need to get over there and take a look at it, talk a little bit about harvesting and maybe some of the things that have happened with corn in your garden as well as in ours here on Oklahoma Gardening. I think about everybody agrees that one of the most delightful vegetables from the garden is sweet corn. And of course, the thing that makes it really delightful is that if it's harvested at the peak stage of maturity. And there are some tips that we may want to consider in harvesting sweet corn or even choosing sweet corn in the grocery store if you haven't the space or the opportunity to grow some in your own home garden. Because if you harvest the sweet corn too early, you certainly don't have the sugars or the flavors developed, and of course you don't have the size of the kernel either. But if you wait too long to harvest the sweet corn, or if you, if you choose over mature sweet corn at the supermarket, those sugars have turned into starch for the most part, and they just don't have the flavor there. So one tip that we may want to consider when harvesting sweet corn or when choosing sweet corn is what we call the fingernail milk test. And by this, we pull the shuck back slightly expose the kernels. Those kernels should be plump and well filled. And then with the tip of our fingernail, just gently press the kernel. And if the juice that escapes is of a milky substance, then that's called the milk stage, and that is the proper maturity for the sweet corn. If it's too, too immature, then this, of course, will find that the kernels are not developed. And if we do push that with our fingernail, then it's a watery look as opposed to a milky look, the juice that comes out. And if it's over mature, it will be rather doughy in feel. One of the things also on sweet corn is that you can choose or choose not to spray for corn earworm. We've talked about spraying for corn earworm earlier in Oklahoma Gardening, and it is quite a rigorous spray schedule to get worm-free corn. We chose here in Oklahoma Gardening not to spray this year and to plant enough corn both for the earworms as well as ourselves. And we've done pretty well because we do have some slight damage, but that can be just removed with a knife or with the shears as we're preparing it for use. But you know, one of the things that probably any average gardener will not have enough room to plant both enough corn for themselves and for one varmint is the raccoon. And that's what's happened out here. We do have some raccoons living around our Oklahoma gardening area. And the raccoons come in the evening and they really feed on the corn. And you can see some of the damage that the raccoons have done. About the only way you can really prevent raccoon damage in your garden and, and particularly in the sweet corn, is by putting a small electrical fence around it where they can't get to the corn. That's probably what we'll do next year, is just put a real short fence that's battery powered and keep the coons out. One of the more interesting um, problems that's shown up in our sweet corn this year, and you may have seen this of it on your own, is a disease called corn smut. Corn smut is a fungus disease, and it will attack any stage of the plant from the very young seedling stage up to the mature plant at harvest, I mean, it, it, as it tassels or as it begins to form its ear. Here we can see where a smut ball has formed uh, in the tassel portion of this stalk. And this smut ball turns out to be a uh, rather slick, uh, membranous-like coating. But inside is a black, powdery-looking substance that looks almost like smut, hence the instance, the name smut ball. This is a fungus disease. It can be spread uh, through the wind or through uh, uh, heavy rainfalls. 
And so to control smut in your garden, you want to observe these balls as they begin to form, cut them out from the plant, either fr from the small plant or off the tassel or off the, the uh, stalk, wherever they may form, put them in a bag don't drop them into your, into your garden or don't put them in your compost pile, but put them down into a bag and tie the bag up and either burn it or else put it in the trash to be disposed of in some proper way because they certainly can be spread throughout your garden, at least in your corn planting, by allowing those smut balls to form. So that's just a little tip that if you've got smut in your garden, good clean sanitary methods such as removing it and then maybe rotating your corn next year it's just a good practice to control it like it is with many diseases. Well, another one of the vegetables that we're really looking forward to here in, in the garden, of course, is watermelons. And they're getting a little bit uh, closer, of course, to maturity. And we always anticipate that first ripe watermelon. But we have had quite a bit of rain this year in Oklahoma, at least right here in, in the Oklahoma gardening area. And of course, we try to keep our watermelons watered also so that we'll have good foliage growth. And so this means that we can have some problems with rot, uh, soil rot showing up on the bottom of our melon. In order to prevent that, as our melons get larger and we start uh, into the season where they begin to ripen, we can protect them from this soil rot by simply getting a meat tray or a heavy piece of cardboard, this is a styrofoam meat tray, slipping it underneath the melon and letting the melon just rest on it. And that way it will keep the melon off of the soil, keep the bottom of that melon relatively dry so that this rot organism will not be as apt to take hold and also keep the bottom of the melon clean. Now you, I turned this tray upside down so the water could would run off and it wouldn't collect water. If you choose to, you could put it inside the tray such as this, poke a few holes in it and allow the water to drain away. We're using some uh, trays here that are rather large for, for meat trays for the melons. We also have some smaller ones here that we put underneath our cantaloupes and do the same thing. But it's just a little tip to help us keep this melon from developing rot from the bottom of it. <laughs>